Welcome to People Love Process. Working digitally gives us a lot of creative flexibility and allows us to customize our preferred creative workflow. I think that's really important to establish. Uh, when I went to art school, I learned everything traditionally, and we're talking stat cameras, press type, etc. Then towards the last end of the last year, we moved into the digital realm. I actually used an Apple Lisa. If you ever played that game Battle Zone, that's what the graphics look like. It's kind of crazy. But that's the very first, um, well, actually, not the very, f actually, the very first Mac I interacted with was an Apple II in high school. Uh, then the Apple Lisa at the end of art school. And then a friend's family bought uh, an iMac, and I kind of did a little digital, my first digital illustration on that at their house, playing around with that. But that's another story for another day. Some methods like drawing, I still prefer to work traditionally. Um, I enjoy it. I like the tactile experience. But that said, my daughter Savannah sketches and illustrates most of her art completely within a digital workflow on an iPad Pro. And that is awesome as well. So in this movie, I want to show you how you can take a doodle, digitize it, then edit, color, and detail it. This is going to be a fun one. This is going to be a style anybody watching this video can pull off. So I encourage you to do that, and I'll encourage you at the end to try a design of your own using the same methodologies I'm going to walk you through here. So let's dive uh, right into it. Now, I love Papermate flare pins, and uh, I usually doodle with them. I don't even remember why I drew this guy, but I kind of liked it. So I went back to this same doodle and then inked on top of it with another pin. Now, years ago, my daughter turned me on to these uh, brush pins by uh, sold by jetpins.com, which is a Japanese uh, company. And they're really great. These pins are actually created by Pentel, which I think is a U.S. brand. But the versions they sell from their the Japanese site are better than the ones I bought off of like Amazon here in the States. So I still order them from uh, Japan, this is what they look like, but they allow me to do this really organic kind of line work and work out those thick and thins. Um, it's all based off of my doodle, but I wanted it to be a bit more organic and kind of uh, crude, not perfect and clean uh, that you associate with kind of vector art. Now, of course, this is a uh, this is a physical drawing, so somehow I have to get it onto my desktop, and I'll show you that in a second. But if you prefer digitally drawing rather than drawing uh, with pen or a pencil on paper and doing it the old-fashioned way like I prefer, that's fine. You can use the iPad. There's all kinds of apps now uh, that, that allow you to do digital drawing on the iPad. Um, Adobe has Fresco, and you can do digital drawing on that. You can do it in raster. You can do vector-based drawing, and I've covered that in previous movies. Uh, you can use probably the most popular one is Procreate, and rightly so. It's an amazing app. I love watching tutorials on that. I don't really use Procreate, um, but the reason why they've gained such a following is they really listen to their user base. Adobe could learn a lot from that. Uh, I should just point that out right off the top. My daughter uses another app. Um, it, it started for manga type of drawing. Um, I think it was called Manga Studio back in the day, but they've rebranded since then to Clip Studio Paint. And she does amazing illustration and all of her sketches and drawing on her iPad Pro uh, using an Apple Pencil. So she could have drawn this on the iPad Pro. So whichever way you prefer, analog or digital, drawing is still the best friend for creativity. So I encourage you to draw. Now, to get my original sketch to the desktop, I have a flatbed scanner. So... Uh, my artwork, my drawing, the, the ink drawing I did is about four and a half by four and a half inches square. And I scan it in at 600 to 800 PPI with the flatbed scanner, save it out as a TIFF image, bring it into Illustrator, place it into Illustrator. And this is what I'm going to now go ahead and image trace. Let's go ahead and just hold the 
uh, space bar down and move our artboard over because we need to open up image trace window. I'll open that up here and we'll select it. Once you, by the way, if you don't have an image selected, everything will be grayed out. So if you open up the window and you have this selected, it might still be grayed out. Just deselect and then reselect and it should become active. Now it's really simple. There's a lot of options on here and I always default to the simplest method that works good. And in this case, I wanna image trace this as tight as possible. It's gonna be a lot of anchor points, but we can optimize them. I'll show you that in a little bit. Uh, we're gonna take this top row on paths, bring it all the way to the right, and the bottom row on noise, bring it all the way to the left. Now, one thing I need to point out is in previous movies where I showed image tracing, I'd always tell you to go down and make sure under advance, you'd have, usually this is closed, you'd have to open up, go down here and click on what used to be there called ignore white. For whatever reason, and this is the part about the Illustrator team that I just don't get some of the decisions they make. They removed it now. Why did they remove it? Does, do you not need to do that anymore? No, you actually still do, but they made it so you have to manually do it now. You can't tell, you can't tell the functionality to do it for you. And I'm just going, that's not easier. You just made it more work. Why would you do that? Who was asking, hey, Adobe, could you remove the ignore white? Nobody was. They just decided to remove it. And it's kind of silly. And I'll show you why it's silly. So uh, with all these settings, we'll leave everything else default and we'll just click on trace. Now, in order to get access, it's trace now, but in order to get access to the uh, vector art, you have to go up to your control panel and click expand. Now, I highly recommend that you always keep control on. That will put this bar at the top, the control bar, and it's a shortcut to things you're doing at the time, much like the properties panel, but in my opinion, more accessible. And here we'll just go up and click expand. That'll create the vector art. You can see we have a ton of anchor points there. We can close the image trace window now. And if you go over to, um, I have a plugin by Astute Graphics Pathscribe, and it's telling us we have 22,502 anchor points. So yes, I traced it uh, extremely tight. But here's the problem with what Illustrator changed in the image trace. Let's go ahead and just center our window back on our artwork here. Is if I select the art, you know, and I double click into it into isolation mode, it has the background shape that's just a white fill. Why would you ever want this? It's like you could still have gotten it if you just didn't select ignore white on the previous version of how image trace work, but for whatever reason, again, they got rid of it. So what you have to do now and remember to do is you select this and then you'll have to go, if you don't have, I have a keyboard shortcut where I can select one item and go option F1, it'll select all the other items that are the same fill color. That makes this, not too hard to fix for me, but if you don't have that, you have to select, let's say the background image first, go to select, go to same, go to same fill color, and then it will select everything. Once everything's selected, that's white fills, and that's denoted by the swatches panel, just hit delete. And this is what you used to get um, by default by clicking on ignore white. Once again, why did they remove it? Did it make the process simpler, easier? No, it's more of a hassle now. So it makes no sense why they removed it. We have a straggler I noticed over here, so we'll direct select that and delete it. So normally in the past, this is what you get, which makes it extremely easy to use. Now, uh, before I do the next thing I wanna do on this artwork, looking at it in a digital form is, I'm going to go ahead and copy this to the clipboard. We'll turn this layer off and I want to address live paint. I'm going to go command F to paste it onto this layer because uh, what I'm going to show you is what I normally do. I'm going to show you how I normally go about coloring artwork like this. 
But whenever I do that, I, I always get email from people going, why don't you use live paint? Well, I decided to show you guys. Um, <laughs> okay, they probably don't sound like that. That was me just uh, kind of doing stupid acting there. <laughs> I'm going to show you how to use live paint, basically. But before we do, let's, let's optimize our artwork. And uh, you can tell after we remove those white shapes, we now have only 11,000 anchor points. That's still a ton of anchor points. So we're going to go to object. We're going to go to path. And we're going to go to simplify. Now, because I have something selected in my settings for simplify, which is this, retain my latest settings and directly open this dialog, um, it will just show you a little thin pop-up with the slider bar. Um, click into this menu so you can see the full context. I, again, why did they oversimplify it? Because it actually makes it harder. <laughs> I don't know. That's the kind of decisions that frustrate me about the Adobe team. Uh, but here you can see by going down to 80 and uh, you could adjust this angle. I'm going to leave it the same. It's now going from 11,245 points to 6,000 which is a lot more uh, optimized. And it doesn't look like it's de destroying the quality of the work because we have preview on. Because we want that organic look, we just don't want to have just a stink load of anchor points we don't need. So I'm going to click OK. We'll say yes. Now, because you see all the anchor points, it kind of uh, is obtusive to viewing the artwork clean. So if you want to... You could use uh, go command H and it's still selected. And you have to remember that because every time I turn off the anchor point preview, I forget about it and I colorize it, especially if I'm using a method like uh, uh, live paint. So how do you live paint this? Well, let's figure out what color we want to use first. So I'll just go ahead and click on red. I think we'll start there. And to activate live paint, all you have to do is hit the K key, it'll bring it up, and you'll see that it shows you this paint bucket. That's how you will fill all these shapes inside your artwork with this paint bucket. And the nudge keys on your keyboard will allow you to scroll through colors. If you go right, it'll go right. If you go left, it'll go left. And I'll show you more about that in a little bit. But let's go ahead and color some of our shapes here. So if I go to the foot, we'll color the foot. Oh, we have to have the artwork selected. I'll color the foot here. Just click. And you can see it fills it. And it makes the process pretty simple. It'll show you the anchors whenever you have a shape selected. But let's say uh, whenever I'm coloring like this, I'm trying to balance the colors so none of them are right next to his tongue. Definitely needs to be red. Maybe the inner part of his ear, like that. And maybe we do this down here. Now, if we want to change the colors, I'm going to bring this up next to the swatches palette. Let's say we want to use green next. And this is one reason why I don't use live paint. I don't find the process faster in my opinion. If I go to the left with the nudge keys, it scrolls through all the colors. So if you have a lot of colors in your swatches panel, um, this doesn't speed things up. It's actually faster if you could just go over, select a, select a shape, go over, click the swatch and color it. And, and that's the part that I'm trying to get across here. It's not bad in terms of how it functions, in terms of the of the um, paint bucket fill option. You can select different elements, maybe here, 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 uh, maybe this part of his arm. We can color this part of the leg, maybe this part of the leg. So it does allow you to color pretty simply. Um, I just don't find it goes much faster than the normal way I do it. So I just wanted to show you that if you prefer to work this way, that's great. You can work this way. Once again, it's important for you to figure out what works best for you. For me, um, much like uh, if I go to Windows, the contextual taskbar, um, I think that gets in my way. So I just turn it off. I don't prefer that. Some of you might prefer it, in which case use it. Uh, that's what I want you to consider. So I'm going to show you the way I normally do it. 
And unfortunately, it's a little trickier because they oversimplified. Let's go ahead and turn the anchors back on. Um, I always forget things are selected when I can't see the anchors. So we'll just go Command H to bring that back like this. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Compound Path and I'm going to go to Release like this. And we might need to go to Object and ungroup it. And you might have to do that a few times. We only had to do it once. Come back here. I'm going to deselect the outermost of all these shapes. And you can see we have some artifacts here. Those will clean up as we go along. This shape here, we'll go ahead and deselect that because that will knock through the background shape. All these shapes, we'll go ahead and fill it white. So these are just, let's go ahead and select that isolated one there. We'll take this one and all I'm going to do is I'm going to color this this color, select the black and I'm going to go minus front, select this, unite it with this. Right now it's a group so I'll create a compound. I'll copy it to the clipboard, select all my white, and go Command B to paste behind like that. And this is how I set up my artwork. Now I noticed I had, if I go Command A, I noticed I had a couple stragglers, little artifacts. Let's zoom in here. And you are going to have artifacts, um, little tiny things like this. Just select them, delete them as you discover them like that. So keyline view helps. So just think of this as you have a black um, kind of uh, foundation and then sitting on top of it are shapes just filled with white, no outlines. This is the way I like, I prefer to work. And then um, as I do coloring, and this goes back to my freehand days where you could drag physical swatches, how the swatches palette to the desktop, and I would tile them to figure out my color. Well, now I just do it manually. Um, I have a new document profile that I had a coder set up for me. So when I create a new document, it'll automatically make a tonal family layer with shapes like this on my artboard already. So um, all we're going to do, and by the way, my new document profile always contains these core asset colors that are all global. That's the important thing, and I'll show you that in a little bit. But we're just going to select the palette that we want to use on this. It's going to be a dark blue. We'll go down here and select a nice purple. And then on this one, a green, kind of a lime green. We'll go here. This one will be, let's do orange. We'll do a nice red. We'll select this, give it a bright medium blue. And then we'll go to... Um, a nice gold color like that. So once I've established my tonal family, then I'll just start applying color. And so the way I normally do it, you saw how I did it with the, the live paint mode. So if we do the red again, I think I did the foot, this, this one. And again, as I'm coloring on a design like this, um, I'm trying to balance out the colors. So We'll color this, and I think I did the inside of the red. Then I'll just switch to the eyedropper sample, my swatch that I have on my palette. Now, as I'm looking at this, um, the one thing that I did in my drawing in analog that I wish I would have inked it differently is I don't like how it kind of goes inward. I want his, his kind of the front part of his chest just to be a nice round here. So this is where we're going to use uh, the blob brush. Now the blob brush is awesome. Uh, you just want to make sure it's on accurate. If you put it to smooth, it'll over optimize it. So you want to make sure it's on accurate and then merge only with selection. I'll show you what that means, but we want to work about two points and we're going to click. Okay. We'll go ahead. And since we have red selected, I'll just do a red shape. And this just shows you, and I'm just using my mouse. If you're using a Wacom, it's going to be even easier to control. So all it does is it creates 
a, a fill shape, no stroke. Now in this case, I'd want to direct select the inner and get rid of it, but you can see it matches the aesthetic in the image trace we want, and that's why we want to use this. Now, if I go back to the blob brush, and let's say I draw another shape like this, it's going to automatically fuse with this shape. So if I didn't want this, I'd just select it and delete it. But that's how you can fuse it together. Now, if I undo that, so we go back to this original shape, go back, click back into the blob brush and go merge only with selection. And I draw out that same kind of shape like this. It'll create the shape, but it won't automatically merge it. So just depending on what you prefer, I kind of prefer it to automatically uh, merge with it. So I'm going to click in here and uh, turn that off. And because we're creating uh, the breastplate uh, of this character, almost like a multicolored werewolf of sorts, uh, we're going to use white. And all I'm going to do is just draw a shape that kind of mimics the profile I wish I would have drawn on my artwork, kind of like that. Then you can direct select the part you want to get rid of. That looks good. And I also think on this knee, um, I kind of like how this looks with the multi rings. And this just has almost looks like a, I don't know what you'd call it, like a knee pad type thing. So what I'm going to do, just so you can see it, let's go ahead. I'll select red. And with the blob brush, I'm just going to draw a shape here. Like this, and I'm kind of going slow just so I can make it look a little more organic. I don't want it perfect. That's why this style works so well. Then I can select the interior shapes and get rid of them. Select this, select the, the knee shape and go minus front. Then I'll just ungroup it. And that way I have two independent shapes I can color. So that's one thing. It's going to be a lot harder to do that before you use live paint. And so that's why I don't use live paint, because there's always things I want to tweak as I go along. I want the flexibility to do that as easy as possible. So let's go ahead and apply, apply other colors. So we'll do the nose, maybe the ear, maybe the mane on the back of his head will all be the same color. I think I'm going to do purple. And then... Where else? We need to get some down here. Maybe his foot, that ring. These can all be purple. And once I've applied it, I can sample this. I don't always have to go up and uh, kind of uh, sample the, the tonal family. I think that looks good. We'll do green next. We'll do his muzzle, maybe behind his eye here. All these will be green. We do these two shapes. Those will be green, back arm, maybe that, and this part of the leg, all those will be green. Then we'll do orange, go here, apply orange, maybe the bottom of his mouth. Maybe we have these two in the hand orange. We'll bring orange down here. Looks good next to the purple. Bring it down here on the knee. And I think that looks good. Let's do the next color. We've done red. We'll do blue. We'll do the front and here. Those will be blue. Maybe the hand down here, blue. The knee here. Maybe that's blue. And maybe that's it, I guess. And then all the remaining ones, what color do I, uh, yellow. So we'll just select those and color them yellow. I think that looks good. And the outline, I don't want it black. That's no fun. Oh, you know what? We need to color that orange. It's flames. Take that. I think instead of black, create a nice blue. I think 
blue looks okay. I might go back and change that, but I don't want these, like the white here or in the teeth to be stark white because it almost looks like it's just showing through to the background color, which is white. So we're gonna color this the dark blue. And because it's a, it's a global color, we can go to the color and I'm just gonna reduce this down so it's just 5%. So it's kind of an off-white and I think that looks better. So that's what I'm gonna do there. And I think that looks good, but the more I look at it, I think I'm not so sure about that blue. So let's go to our swatches. We know we use this blue. I'm gonna click into this and I think a warmer color would work better. We have enough warm hues in this. So let's see, we'll go 100% magenta. Oops, 100% yellow. Don't need 100% blue. Still want a little blue in it. Ooh, I'm liking that, but let's add a little more black, 45. That looks good. So what we had, oops. Well, we'll just make this 46 and go okay. So that looks pretty good. Now, the nice thing about using global colors is you can make easy color changes like that, but wherever you've used that previous color in terms of the tints we use and the eye and the teeth, it automatically updates on it. So it just makes, makes it a lot easier uh, to do those kind of edits. So I think this is looking really good, but the next thing I wanna add is some detailing to this continuing to use the blob brush. And this is where we, we need to create shading hues. So um, actually, the more I think about this, this green is kind of bugging me. So actually I can just select green. I can go option F1 selects all green. I'm gonna pick a different color. Maybe, oh yeah, that looks a lot better. Uh, aqua, I think that goes better. Green had too much yellow in it. We have enough yellow, so that looks good. Uh, now we're gonna create shading hues for these colors. So I'm just gonna turn this on. We have three of them selected over here, but the first one we wanna do is a shading hue for purple. So this was the base color we used on the nose and on the back of his head and on his uh, right foot here in the image. Uh, we're gonna edit this and create a shading value and we're gonna go to color, click on the CMYK so we can adjust the color break. And we're just gonna punch in and we're gonna kind of break these in half. So instead of a 55, half of 50 is uh, 25. So maybe we do 26. And if we adjust this to approximate half, maybe about 33. And then we wanna add some black to it because we are gonna use this for shading. We'll add 15. So you can see it create a muted value. And then all I have to do is I'm gonna drag this down into a folder, double click on it, select global and click okay. So we have that global color applied there. We're gonna do the same thing here. Go to color, click on CMYK and we'll adjust the values here. We want this muted half of 70, 35, half of 40. 20 and then add some black to it. Maybe we go, I don't know, 25, something like that. That might be a little much, but we can always come back and adjust it. We'll drag this, double click, select global, click OK, and we'll do orange will be the last one. So let's go ahead and create the shading value on this one. Maybe for magenta, we knock this back to approximate half, knock this back in half, and then add 15 of black. If you think like traditional pigments, if you're painting, uh, to get a nice sh shading color, you're gonna add some black to it. And that's essentially what we're doing here. We're just thinking the same way, but applying it in a digital context. We'll bring this color down, drop it in, double click, select global, 
And now to make these work, because these are just muted values, we go to transparency and we go to multiply and you can see it creates a nice value for shading. And you can control this by going to opacity to control the value. If you don't want it 100%, in this case, we knock it down to 70. I can select this one and I can go multiply. We'll use the same value of 70. I'll go here. Go ahead and multiply again, knock this one down to 70 and you can adjust the intensity. So there's good contrast, not only between the base colors, but the shading uh, values as well. Multiply like that. And let's do the blue multiply to 70. Now this one, I'll just double click into this. Um, this is one where on magenta, I want to re remove more than half because it's a lighter value and I don't add a ton of black. In this case, I only add 10% because it can look muddy. And this is where I'd argue that Adobe or maybe a plugin provider needs to come up with a new blend mode, which could be called shading. Every illustrator that works um, in Vector would absolutely go bonkers over that. Um, every time I try to explain it to developers, they don't really get it. Uh, but I think it'd just make life easier. So rather than being, in this case, six different things, it would just be one shape and you could select the shading blend mode and then adjust the intensity, have other controls that show up in the transform palette. It just seems like it'd be awesome. I don't know why they can't figure that out. So we're gonna do some, what I call blob detailing. So we'll turn on the blob layer and I'm gonna zoom in cause we need to be close in on the nose here. And I'll take the blob brush and I'm gonna select the shading value for purple here. And with the blob brush, we're still using the uh, two point um, setting. If we go in here, you can see it's two point. If you want to go down to one, we can make this a little smaller. Let's go 1.5, come back here. And then I'm thinking my light source is coming from the left and hitting it. So I'm keeping that in mind as I'm drawing these shapes out. And keep in mind, I'm just using a mouse to draw these, then you select the inner part like that, select the shape of the nose, clone it, Command-C, Command-F, select the shading, intersect with Pathfinder. It'll say there's a lot of, there's a, a lot of, what? Filter, no, what? What are you talking about? I have two shapes. I have this one. Oh, wait a minute. Is this a, no, that's a path. And then I have this, oh, that, oh, it has a group. That's why, okay. Uh, let's go in, select that little artifact, get rid of it. And now it should just be a regular, no, it's still a group. Okay, fine. We'll just go ahead and create a compound, select both these shapes and go intersect. That's what we want. Then we can set the blend mode to multiply and we use 70 here like that. And if I'm not zoomed in, I only zoomed in to do the, the blob work. You know, if you're not zoomed in, let's go ahead and do the next one. I'll show you what you can do. Um, we'll pick the shading for the, the kind of teal color we have going here. And because the light's coming from the left, the light would hit here, cast a shadow of the nose onto the mu muzzle. That's kind of what I'm thinking. So it might cast a shadow. And y there's a lot of artistic freedom here. This isn't realistic. So whatever looks good in your opinion is fine. So I create a shape like this. Again, select the inner part like this. Now, if I wanted to um, set the blend mode, if I'm not zoomed in, I could select this, go to the eyedropper, sample our shading hue up here, and it'd give me that. Or actually, before we do that, let's go ahead and clone this shape, Command-C, Command-F, select this, intersect it, then sample the shading and apply it like that. So you could do it that way as well. Um, so it's not hard to do this, this, type of, this type of shading. It's actually kind of fun. 
Um, what we're going to do next is I want to add some detail in the eye. So we'll go back to the blob brush. And if I select this color, just to define the color selection, uh, we're going to draw with this medium blue because I want to create kind of a shadow that cascades over the eye shape, kind of like that. Select the inner part, get rid of it. Select the eye shape, copy it, Command C, Command F, select both, intersect with Pathfinder. Right now, I think this can be a group. Oops, go to Appearance, Group. We'll make that a uh, compound. I'll color it the blue. Because it's a global color, uh, we'll be able to tint it. So I'll bring this all the way down to about 20, like that. And it creates a nice little shading on the eye, like that. And that's all we're going to do. Let's do let's do one more. Uh, we'll do let's do red. We haven't done red, so we'll do this. We'll select the shading value for red, which is this muted color. We'll go to the blob brush, and since the light's being cast down from above, his toes are going to be darker here on the tips, like that. We don't even need to make an independent shape. We could just go like this to create all of the shapes like that. It doesn't have to be pretty as long as it's going to work. And then we're going to have little shadows in between his toes here. And maybe one here. Again, a lot of flexibility here with artistic license, whatever you think looks good like that. And not just shading, but we can, let's go one step further. Uh, we could also go into the blob brush if we want this to be smaller and we could go 0.5. And oops, I think it can only go down to, yeah, one point. That's fine. We'll just do that. I don't know, you would think it's digital. Why can't it go to 0.5? What's the big deal there? Um, oops, that looked bad. So maybe we go over here because we just want to create like three kind of lines. Again, I'm doing this with my mouse. So if you have a Wacom, it's probably going to be easier. And I'm doing it over here because Trying to do it on an angle with the mouse isn't necessarily straightforward and easy. So create something like this. Maybe it's too tall. You could squash it. If you think this guy's too close, go like that. Select this. Brand over here. Rotate it into the orientation of the feet. And this is just like, I don't know, hairy foot detail, I guess. We'll select all the shading shapes. This is where we'll just unite them. So we'll go to Pathfinder. We'll go to Unite. You can see it's going to default to a group. We want this to be a compound. Select the foot. Copy it. Command C, Command F. Select the shapes. Intersect. Turn it back into a compound. Right now it's the base color. So we'll just zoom out until we can see the shading value. Sample it with eyedropper and it puts that shading detail on the foot. So that's how I do shading. Now, I'd want to do uh, highlighting, but it works the exact same way. But first, let me show you all the final. Let's get rid of the part on the feet. We're done with that. Uh, we're going to go ahead and turn on all the final shading. So I turn those on. You can see how those look. That looks really cool. Some of the other detail I put on the muzzle, like little uh, indication of hair on his snout, on his chest, his feet, and it just works really well. Now, the same principle applies using the blob brush. Uh, you can do all, uh, you can simply create a shape like this. And if I select this, go to transparency, maybe you make it 20%, maybe 30% like that, and you get little highlights. So super easy to do highlighting. You can always use white to go over that. And it's a fun style to work in, but you can see how it works. It's not hard. Anybody can do this style too. That's the beauty uh, 
of it. So I recommend, um, well, first, let's go ahead and turn on the final art. Here I had some fun with Offset. Now, it, now that I look at this in hindsight, the, the further out it goes, it started with this, this crude shape and I just offset it, but then it progressively gets simpler. So kind of a, a psychedelic way to uh, handle the final art here. Uh, you can handle it any way you want, but what I want you to do is figure out a theme and it could be an art of anything. It could be uh, kind of a graphic design. You could do a character. Uh, just have fun with it. Make it a plant. Doesn't matter. Um, but try these methodologies. This is a fun style to work in. And even if you don't have a tablet like a Wacom Cintiq, uh, drawing with the blob brush and Illustrator using a mouse is still pretty easy. Uh, remember, accessing the exercise files for um, any of my People of Process movies help support this channel. At last count, we're only five people away from reaching 10,000. That's awesome. So I thank everybody who's watching. Uh, so <clears throat> check out the link in the description below this video uh, to access exercise files for any of the movies um, on this channel. Thank you again for those who have become members of this channel. Uh, you get to see a lot of inside peeks on just real world client work that I'm working on that I share uh, to members only. And that gives you additional insight into uh, how you can use methods that I show on this channel within your own client work. So uh, if you haven't done that, consider it. I'd appreciate it. And I'm going to be creating something specifically for members soon. So, um, uh, so check that out. Until next time, again, to everybody who watches this channel, thank you for watching People of Process. And as always, I hope this content helps you to improve your own creative process.